So in this lecture, we're going to continue our discussion where we talk about substituent effects, particularly in the case of electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions. Now, um, there are two ways a substituent um, can influence the electronics of <clears throat> a um, molecule and these electronics control the chemical properties of that molecule. Now I'm not necessarily talking about electron donating and electron withdrawing. Those are just kind of outcomes where you can pull electrons away or push electrons in. I'm saying like when we have an electron donating group or an electron withdrawing group, how does it do its job? How do we withdraw electrons and donate electrons? And that comes down to um, two approaches. One is resonance effects and the other is inductive effects. Let's start with resonance effects. In resonance effects, resonance structures show that the electrons move in into, and that would be for donating, or out of, and that would be for withdrawing, using delocalized, um, move into or out of mo a, uh, a molecule by way of delocalized pi uh, bonds, okay? Okay, a lot of words. Let's just sum it up by saying that um, we can draw resonance structures to show the movement of electrons. So we can show these, um, um, show movement of electrons. And these utilize pi bonds. <clears throat> so these utilize pi bonds. Okay, now that's in contrast to the, the, the alternative approach, and I'm gonna highlight this. The alternative approach is inductive effects. Inductive effects are a little bit more vague. Resonance effects may feel vague at this point, but once we start drawing resonance structures, it should make more sense. So inductive effects are a bit more vague. In inductive effects, what we do is we um, move electrons into, and again, that's donating, and out of, which is withdrawing, a molecule through sigma bonds. So in contrast to resonance effects, which require the movement of electrons through pi bonds, Inductive effects require the movement of electrons through sigma bonds. It wasn't just any pi bond either, it was delocalized pi bonds or pi bonds in conjugation. We'll look at that more when we look at resonance structures. Now, unfortunately, we can't use resonance structures when trying to describe inductive effects. So they can't be described using resonance structures. So how do we at least think about these things if we can't picture them with resonance structures? These are due to differences in electronegativity. Whereby more electro and 
Let's recall, it's been a while since organic one. I'm gonna write EN is electronegativity. So more EN elements are more withdrawing. Okay. All right, so let's look at an example of this. Now we said before that if I take a benzene and I attach an oxygen directly to the benzene, that counts as an electron donating group. The reason why is that O is directly attached. Okay, so my reasoning is based on just what I told you to memorize from last time. Just memorize when an oxygen is directly attached to a benzene ring, it will, um, it will donate electron density into the ring system and it activates the reaction in electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions. But you know, now we know why this can occur. It's either inductive effects or resonance effects. So which is it? Which is it, inductive or resonance? How does it accomplish the job of donating electron density into the ring system? Is it inductive effects or resonance effects? Okay, well, let's, let's just take a second and think about this now. Inductive effects happen through sigma bonds. That's a little vague at this point. But um, another way of thinking about it is that when there's a more electronegative element attached to the ring, we're going to see inductive withdrawing. That is, it's more electronegative, so it's soaking the electrons away. Now, it's doing that through um, polarized sigma bonds, okay? That is um, single bonds. It's just taking, saying, I'm more electronegative. I have a different makeup in my nucleus. So I'm going to suck electron density towards me in my sigma bond. And as a result, we get a distorted sigma bond. It's all stuff we talked about in organic one. So inductively, it doesn't seem to be a donor. And in fact, that's the case. It's inductively withdrawing. So how is it a donating group? Well, it turns out it's a strong donor by way of resonance. Okay, so if it's, so you're saying it's electron withdrawing by inductive effects and electron donating by way of resonance effects, but you just want us to memorize that it's an electron donating group. And the reason why is it's, it's actually both of these things happening at once. It's the inductive um, effects and resonance effects are both occurring at the same time and they're in competition with each other. Now, as strong as inductive effects um, sort of were discussed in organic one, we actually talked about them a lot, we just didn't define the term. As much as we talked about them, they're not that strong compared to resonance effects. So both resonance and inductive effects are occurring at the same time and both are in competition. And this is always the case to some degree um, when you have resonance effects. Like there's always some inductive effect that's present. Hopefully it's working with the resonance effects. This happens to be one where it's not. And what we say though, is that when they're competing with each other, resonance effects win. Okay, well, why do they win? It's because they, it's a stronger effect. I mean, we can always, we can just draw resonance structures, different structural depictions showing the movement of electrons. Whereas with inductive um, groups, we have to just draw a little dipole arrow and it's just not as strong as the resonance effects. So the both of these things are competing. Okay, so let's depict the inductive effects. And these are again, um, weak effects overall. If there's no resonance effects, then they'll take the cake, they'll win the day, but these are weak overall. But what we do is we just say, okay, here's benzene. We have a sigma bond to an inductively withdrawing group. So what we do is we draw a dipole arrow. It's one of these ones where it's going in the opposite direction of our curly arrows. It's heading towards the delta minus from the delta positive. These are partial charges indicating that Carbon is less electronegative than the oxygen, so the oxygen is polarizing the bond between those two to soak the suck the electrons towards itself. Okay, 
So there's our depiction of the inductive effects, but now let's depict the resonance effects. When we depict the resonance effects, we draw resonance structures. Okay, now let's just be clear. When we've got a methoxy group on a benzene, our starting structure, the one we all wanna draw, this is our best resonance structure. Right, there's no charge separation, everything has an octet. But we can take a lone pair of electrons on the oxygen and push down to make a carbon oxygen double bond. That would require us to push electrons in the benzene pi system over to make a carbon atom have those lone pair of electrons. And if, it's, if it has a lone pair of electrons, then it must have a negative formal charge at this position, which counters the oxygen now with its positive formal charge. Okay. It's not a great resonance structure, but it's a resonance structure nonetheless. And it's not particularly bad. We've just lost aromaticity and introduced charge separation, which isn't great. Okay, we haven't broken the octet rule. We can actually keep pumping these electrons around the ring. We can go from a position ortho to the oxygen to a position para to the oxygen. That's gonna move the negative charge to the southernmost carbon. We could do this again. And that's going to put the lone pair on the ortho side opposite to where that lone pair first started when it was introduced into the ring system. Still a positive charge in the oxygen, negative charge in the carbon bearing the lone pair. And if we push the electrons over to make a carbon-carbon double bond, push the electrons back up on the oxygen, we get back to our original structure. Now, these are, um, these are interesting resonance structures. What they do is they kind of showcase that by looking at resonance structures, we can have more electron density inside the benzene ring. There's a negative charge. There's an extra lone pair of electrons. We have absorbed electron density from delocalized pi bonds with that oxygen. Okay, delocalized pi electrons. That is, there are electrons on the oxygen atom that are apparently in conjugation with the pi system in the aromatic ring, and it's donating electrons that wouldn't be there if we had benzene by itself. So the lone pair on oxygen gets donated to the aromatic ring. And that happens through resonance. Now what resonance is, is it's a, it's a great term to, to remind us that we're drawing resonance structures, but what it really is, is um, delocalized pi electrons. If you're not comfortable with this term delocalized yet, just take out the D and localized would be the opposite where they're stuck in place. They're, they're yeah, they're sort of in their little, they're, they're on their atom, and they can't move anywhere else. So when they're delocalized, they're able to kind of move about the molecule. Okay. The other thing I want to make note of is that in these resonance structures, what you notice is that we can depict the negative charge, the electrons that were received by the benzene from the oxygen, but we can only depict them in certain sites on the benzene. We can only depict them at the ortho and para position. Okay, so it turns out that not only do, or not does, do, the resonance structures show how electrons are donated. But they also suggest where an electrophile might react. So they also suggest where an electrophile might react. Okay, now what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at those other resonance structures, the alternative resonance structures that didn't include the best resonance structure, the one that we started with, 
had a negative charge here, positive charge up here, or here, or here. Okay, we call this an ortho negative charge. We have the negative charge at the para position over here. Then we have another ortho negative charge on the rightmost structure. Now let's let our intuition guide us. If we took each of these resonance depictions and kind of fixed them in place and said, okay, let's add an electron, an electrophile, excuse me, not an electron, an electrophile to each of these structures, where would it go? We'll let your intuition guide you. The negative is attracted to the positive. And what we get <clears throat> are the same resonance depictions where we've neutralized the negative charge with the positive electrophile giving us an electrophile at the ortho position. or the para position. Now there's two ortho positions that are the same by symmetry. I'm not gonna to worry too much about that double bond to an oxygen as we'll see in a second. It turns out it's not going to matter. Small correction here. Okay, oh, not a negative charge, goodness. An electrophile, okay. So now what we can do is if we're adding an electrophile to this, like through an electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction, we can actually take each of these intermediates and re-aromatize them. How do we re-aromatize? Well, after we add an electrophile, we consider a hydrogen at the carbon that received the new atoms, and we just let that hydrogen fall off. That'll re-establish aromaticity. Now it has to occur at the carbon that accepted the electrophile. So it's the ortho position in the first structure, the para position in the second structure, and the opposite ortho position in the third structure. So in either, in all cases, we're gonna lose H plus. That's going to give rise to structure where we've got an electrophile at the ortho position in a now benzene molecule, the para position, and the opposite ortho position, which is the same as the first structure by symmetry. Now it turns out this is fairly general. What this suggests is that, um, is that uh, electron donating groups will select for ortho para products. So if you do a reaction with an electron donating group present on the molecule, you will actually see only the ortho and para um, products of electrophilic aromatic substitution form. You don't see any reaction at the meta position. Why no reaction at the meta position? Well, we don't have resonance structures to support electron density being donated to the meta position. So we select for reaction at the ortho and para position. So another term that we use, and this like deserves highlighting with as much highlighting ink as you can stomach, um, we say that these are ortho, <coughs> excuse me, para directors. And they are activators. Now that reaches back to last lecture where I said that if you have electron donating groups, they will activate the benzene because the benzene is a nucleophile in this case. And so it uses that extra electron density to, um, to proceed in a more efficient reaction with an electrophile. So we get this selectivity for the ortho and para products. We also see a faster reaction occurring as this is a, a more nucleophilic, uh, more nucleophilic um, uh, uh, benzene ring, excuse me, sorry. Okay, so that's um, an example where we had a substituent present on the benzene ring, and it turned out that it was, it had both inductive and resonance effects.
but the resonance effects dominated because they're stronger. Now, um, the inductive effects worked in the opposite way. They would have withdrawn electron density and deactivated the ring, but the resonance effects were so strong that outcompeted the inductive effects. Let's look at a case where we have an orthopara director, which is an activator, but we don't have any resonance effects. It's only through inductive effects. So it turns out that alkyl, whoop, excuse me, let me get my pen in front of us. Alkyl substituents are activators. And if you're an activator, you're an orthopara director because you donate electron density into the ring system, okay? And you um, select for or direct reaction to the ortho and para positions, never the meta positions. So I want you to kind of think about those things as being synonymous with each other. If you're an activator, you're an ortho para director. Okay. If you're an ortho para director, then you're also an activator. The only exception to this is, is halogens, which we'll look at at the end of um, one of these lectures. Okay. Coming up soon. So alkyl substituents are both activators and ortho para directors. And, and we've seen this before. We've seen when we put a methyl group on benzene and we react it with Br2 in the absence of a catalyst because toluene was so reactive and the same thing would be true for methoxybenzene or anisole, which we looked at previously. If you recall from your notes, we actually only saw two products, one where the bromine was added at the ortho position, another one where it was added at the para position. Okay, so only ortho and para products. That's because the methyl group is an electron donating group and it's an activator. So how do alkyl groups activate slash donate, so I'm gonna draw a little space here, donate electron uh, density into a benzene ring. Okay, let's look at that. So it just turns out that carbon has the same uh, has the same electronegativity as carbon, and we have some additional bonds, some additional electrons from the CH3s. So we do see some inductive effects pushing into the ring um, uh, ever so slightly, just through things like hyperconjugation and that sort of thing. Let's look at this a little bit in a, in a slightly different light. So I'm just going to answer this and say inductive effects. Okay, which is tricky. When it's inductive effects, it's tricky to explain. Sometimes it's easier to explain if there's a true difference in electronegativity, but if you have just a substituent that's the same electronegativity and it replaces hydrogen, it turns out we get the same inductive effects um, or we, we do get an inductive effect boost. Okay, so it's inductive effects. Now it's tricky because uh, we can't draw resonance structures. Sort of. We can draw resonance structures to help out our understanding, but we can't draw them to show electrons actually going into the ring. We could do that previously. We could show a lone pair actually zipping into our aromatic ring by way of a new CO double bond pushing electrons throughout the rings. We got more, we got more actual electron density by resonance, by delocalized electrons that were free to move around. Here, we're not so free to move around, which is sort of a polarization issue. So we can draw resonance structures though to help us understand the effect of the methyl group without, even, without actually pushing electrons in. Let's just compare two resonance structures. Let's take benzene. And I wanna consider a resonance structure where I push electrons over to the side. If you'll notice here, I now have a negative charge at this left position as a lone pair of electrons, okay? But that leaves behind a positive charge over here. Now, what I wanna point out is the positive charge has a hydrogen, um, a, is on a carbon with a hydrogen. Plus charge is on a C with an H, okay? 
Now I wanna change things and consider the same resonance structures when we have a CH3 present, just a simple methyl group. This could be a much bigger alkyl group if we wanted it to be. I'm gonna consider the same resonance structures where I pop the electrons over. And when I do that, I get a lone pair of electrons here, negative charge. Now I have a CH3 on the carbon with a positive charge. And if you look, this is now a plus charge on a fully substituted um, carbon. Okay, so what we say is this is a more stable cation. So we can move the electrons over because we give rise to a more stable, um, it's a more stable kind of cation. And, and what this means is this is a better contributing resonance structure. Now, what's it better than? What's it better than? Well, that's a that that's where this gets a little dicey. Okay, is it better than the first structure? Is it better than our true depiction of toluene? No way. Showing toluene with aromaticity and no charge separation is the way to go. So this is clearly like a second best resonance structure at best. Okay, it's not gonna be the best. So, um, this, this falls down below our non-charge separated species and you know things don't have an octet. But what I wanna do is I wanna compare this resonance structure to that resonance structure for benzene. It's actually much better than the corresponding resonance structure for benzene, which we drew right above it because it has that additional substitution on the positively charged carbon. Better resonance structure than that of benzene. Maybe I'll do like a little kind of color tracking here. So it's better than that resonance structure if you just compare those two. Okay, so the methyl group allows us to sort of make that resonance structure a slightly better contributor than it would be in the case of benzene. And if it's slightly better contributor, then that means the carbon in the upper left corner has slightly more negative character than it would for benzene. And we can actually push that negative charge throughout the ring, right? We could, we could do the exact same exercise we just did and show that if you move the negative charge over here, you still have a positive charge on the carbon with the methyl group, you still have a positive charge on the carbon with substitution. We could swing it around to the upper right. And what this does, what this little exercise does is it also highlights the fact that in this case, without a resonant, oops, I didn't mean to highlight that carbon, without a resonance structure to show a movement of lone pair electrons being dumped into the ring from the substituent, we still get negative charge character by way of these resonance depictions at the ortho and para site. So if they have negative character, that means the ortho para C atoms are nucleophilic. They're more nucleophilic than the metacarbon. Oh shoot, I should mention, I forgot this term, it's called ipso. Ipso is not a big deal, but just a quick aside. Ipso is the carbon with the substituent. So if you've got ortho, meta, para, turns out the carbon with the substituent is I for ipso. Okay. We don't add the we don't add the electrophile there. We don't have a hydrogen to lose. So we're not going to see that reaction at the ipso group unless we have something that can be lost like an H plus, which we don't. Okay, so that'll sort of um, help us, hopefully that helps us understand why we see activation because we get a more nucleophilic ring because we have something that's a little bit more negatively charged. Whoop, I should, I should finish that thought. I didn't finish that thought. Okay, so um, are more nucleophilic than the meta and ipso positions. Now overall, I was about to say this as a wrap up for the lecture, Overall, the benzene ring 
is more nucleophilic. That is, it's been activated because activated and orthopara go together except for the case of halogen atoms. It has been activated. It's more nucleophilic. It has been activated um, than um, benzene by itself. And all of this occurred without resonance. All of this happened without resonance. Okay. So um, what I think I'll do is I'll end there and I'll have a special lecture on halogen atoms by themselves um, before we get into the influence of electron withdrawing groups, because I want us to kind of keep halogens in the back of our mind as these things that sort of break one of these fundamental rules. So that'll do it for this one. Um, and again, we'll pick up with halogens uh, next time.